Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Regeneration Life Church online Thursday night midweek service. Continuing with our topic of Jude, going through Jude verse by verse tonight, we're going to talk about Jude 3, and the title of tonight is Let's Be Contenders. Looking at Jude 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Beloved. The word beloved shows us that this book is written to them that are saved. We talk about love as pouring out of yourself in this series a couple weeks ago. Okay, we, the, the word agapeo in Greek. It really means to pour yourself out. It can be. Uh, it was used by Jesus when he said, "Men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil." They poured themselves into darkness. Uh, used of Jesus also in reference to the Pharisees. They loved the upper seats uh, and feasts. Okay. Now, so when we love each other, it means we pour ourselves out into each other. Okay. One of the marks of being. A born-again Christian is loving the brethren. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. All right, now, here's the thing. What's the difference? Well, hey, hey, man, uh, I'm not a Christian and I love people. Do you? Okay, let's see how much you pour yourself into them uh, when they do something bad to you. Uh, let's see how much you, how much compassion you have for someone when they have smeared you or done something bad. See, this love, the pouring of yourself out, leaves nothing in you for yourself. You understand? So you pour yourself out into other people. You pour yourself out into your brethren, okay? If they need help, you're there. All right, your family, pour yourself out into your family. Okay, I know people right now that the... the that the kid did something bad and the parents are like, it ain't my kid. All right, are they pouring themselves out that, into that child? No, yeah, we all face the flesh. We all have to fight the flesh and temporarily we might fail, but let's, let's look at this. Love itself never fails. We're told that in 1 Corinthians 13. I might fail, but if I have true love, that love inside me doesn't fail. Okay? So anyway, moving on. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. See, Jude's desire was a positive, um, possibly evangel evangelistic, but definitely an uplifting letter. He wanted to speak to them of the common salvation, which is open to all. John uh, twelve thirty two, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, is what Jesus said. Acts 17.30, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Romans 5.18, The free gift came upon all men under justification of life. See, he wanted to, to write unto them about the common salvation, the salvation that was open to all. But, he also says it was needful for me to write unto you, Jude had a, a zeal in him to write a letter about the common salvation, but the Spirit moved him in another direction. All right, it, he, it was needful. It was a compulsion. It was constraining. It was an urgency. The word needful in the Greek refers to a strong pressure. Or again, compulsion, constraining, urgency. It can also mean distress or calamity. The same word is used in 1 Corinthians 9.16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. The same word is in Acts 17.3. Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. Must needs. That love that is inside you also can be considered uh, constraining. All right, you, you kind of, oh, I don't know if I should do it, but I love the person, so I'm going to, okay? So just kind of giving you another look at love. But this is a constraining to change direction. There was something that he wanted to do one thing, he wanted to write about one thing, but there was something that he needed to cover. 
Okay? God can and sometimes does change our direction. For example, in Acts 16.6, 6, Paul and Timothy were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean they were forbidden? It wasn't time yet. There was something else maybe that God wanted them to take care of. Or maybe there was a condition that needed to be put in place over in Asia, and then he would be allowed to go. But you see, Paul and Timothy said, okay, we're going to go into Asia and preach, and God said, oh, wait a minute, hold on just a second, not yet. It wasn't time. God can and does deter our wills when it is necessary. Jude's original intent was maybe to write a letter of encouragement, but he's compelled to deal with a snake whose head needed stopping. He doesn't want to come off as severe. What he is compelled to write to them is severe enough on its own. Jude sat down and most likely write a letter on grace, faith, doctrine, the greatness of Christ, the awesomeness of the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit himself had other plans and had Jude write a letter of warning. That was very necessary. Essentially, Jude wanted to write about true doctrine, but instead the Holy Spirit had him write about fighting false doctrine. Let's face it, it's a lot more fun to encourage the sheep than it is to point out the wolves, or as Wearsby put it, encourage the saints, then declare war on the apostates. Which one's more fun? I think encouraging the saints is more fun. But recently, what I've been called to do is something different in some of my messages. All right? Listen, when the enemies are among you, the watchmen dare not go to sleep. Okay, when you're at war, the last thing you need is when, when there are bullets flying all over the place. Or in this case, maybe swords all over the place. The last thing you need is a comedian. Okay, the, the Christian life is a battlefield, not a playground. So the word exhort means to, itself means to strongly encourage or urge. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's a kind of a strange word to be using there, isn't it? But it, it fits. Provoke. It's like taking a stick and poking. Provoking. Hey, hey, come do something. Right? Luke 14, 23, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Acts 2, 40, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. The untoward, looking away. Untoward is going backwards. All right, it, it, it's uh, people talk about, oh, we're progressive. Well, you can't be progressive if you're walking backwards. Forward! Over the cliff. No, that's not progress. Untoward. Facing away from God. What do we need to do when we're untoward? We need to repent. And then. This world is untoward. All right, now the Greek for exhort, parakalon, is, a, is the Greek form of paraclete, which is usually a reference to the Holy Spirit, for example, in John 14, 16. It also gives a connotation of a wine press. The wine press would squish the grapes until the juice came out, okay? Sometimes strong encouragement or urging puts pressure on the one receiving it, but it is very important that we provoke, I like that word, each other to love and good works. This is what the Holy Spirit does as our paraclete. I said paraclete, not parakeet. We're not talking about little birds. Paraclete, although sometimes the Holy Spirit could be pictured as sitting on your shoulder just like a parakeet, but we're not going to go in that direction. Paraclete! So what the Holy Spirit does. He accompanies us, and He gives the Christian the desire to obey God. Let's look at Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. From the heart. Titus 2, 14, speaking of Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. So the Holy Spirit, as paraclete, 
gives us the desire to obey God from the heart and the zeal for good works. But we are also to provoke each other in that direction unto love and good works. You and I are supposed to be pushing each other in that direction as well. Okay, as such, we are told here in Jude verse 3 to earnestly contend for the faith. Earnest, guys. This is a serious situation that requires a serious response. There's too much syrupy, sweet nonsense in the church. Some churches have a great sound system, but little sound doctrine. Lots of words, but little word. We're called to be serious about the word. We need to take it seriously. Souls are at stake. To earnestly contend means that there's a struggle, a suffering, great stress, a fight. Epigonazai is the word in Greek. It has the root agona from where we get the term agony. It is also the root for the Greek name of the arena where men fought to the death. So the reference here is to intensely fight. And make no mistake, we are fighting for the lives of them that hear us. False doctrine denies eternal life to people. Taking it fast and loose denies eternal life to people. Well, if you're not serious, why should they be? Defending the faith is defending souls. We have to contend. We have to have agony in our contending. A strenuous fight for truth. Jude here has essentially said, I wish you peace. Lots of things I'd like to say. I'd love to encourage you. But you need to know that there's a war here that we need to fight. It's a war against grievous error that will keep men in carnal religion instead of bringing them to Jesus Christ. And if they don't come to Jesus Christ, their souls are damned. Eternally. This is a battle for the souls of mankind. We're not just sitting here discussing religion. This is a precious treasure we need to guard and fight for this precious treasure, this truth in Jesus Christ that saves men's and women's souls. The reasons we fight are back in verse 2. Mercy, peace, and love. You fight so that people can have mercy from God. You fight so that people can have peace with God. You fight so that people can experience the love of God. So that others can experience these in and through faith in Jesus Christ. Now contend, on one hand, is a sports metaphor. The Greek for earnestly contend, as I said, um, epigon is I, can also refer to wrestling. Wrestling match, fighting, intense effort. In Rome, one of their favorite sports was wrestling, where two men would attempt to take each other off of their feet and hold that person down three times, or to grapple until someone gave up and admitted defeat. Wrestling, fighting, striving. Philippians 1.27, stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Contend is also a military word. And the Christian life is war. 1 Timothy 1.18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which, prophecies which went on before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Wherefore art thou also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Lay hold on eternal life. Grab it. Pull it back. The kingdom of, viol uh, kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violence taken by force is what Jesus said. Be violent. Grab a hold. Don't let go. It's a fight. 2 Timothy 2 verses 3 and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Alright, if you're at war, 
The last thing you're going to think is, hmm, I wonder what movie I'm going to see on Thursday night. You got bullets flying around your head? Or in their case, maybe you got a sword in your throat? Gee, I wonder what I'm going to have for lunch tomorrow. I don't think so. You're focused on that war. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. First Peter 4 1, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Hello, somebody. So how do we contend? How do we contend for the faith? Well, first of all, we contend through diligent study to know sound doctrine. You no army that is competent, worth its salt, where the leadership knows what they're doing, is going to send you to war without first giving you training. So we contend through diligent study to know sound doctrine. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Matthew 11.29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly interpreting God's word. Knowing not to take things out of context. Knowing not to play fast and loose with it. Knowing not to try to twist it to say something it doesn't say. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We contend also in refusing to hear false doctrine. Hello, somebody! Refusing to hear false doctrine. Proverbs 19.27 Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. We are to refuse to hear those that deny, first of all, that the Bible is the Word of God. You don't listen to the people that deny that this Bible is the written and revealed Word of the living God. Well, it was written by men. Yeah, well, God used a man's hand to put pen to paper. But that does not mean that the words themselves didn't come from the Most High Almighty God. Isaiah 8.20 To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And this word was the prophecy that was given by God. Does it say, oh, well, he's a little light. You know, you know. No, no light. We are also refused to hear those that deny that hell is real. Well, God really isn't going to punish people because, well, God is a God of love. And a God of love won't send anyone to hell. I had a conversation with a friend of mine recently. And he was ta we were talking about this very thing. And he was telling me that uh, John Maxwell would say something like, you're right. A God of love won't send anybody to hell without giving them a way to get out. God is giving you a way out. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. He's giving people a way out. And I also believe a God of love won't let sin into heaven. Because he lets sin into heaven, what happens? It becomes exactly like the earth and nobody dies. God can't let sin into heaven. Which means the blood sacrifice that he provided deals with that sin through the new nature. Okay. But we cannot listen to people who say there is no hell. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 clearly says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 16, 23. And being in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments. Oh, come on. 
oh, you believe in that hell thing. Don't you know that, that hell was the creation of Christians? I've heard that before. No, it wasn't. Okay? Um, not all Pharisee doctrine was a bad thing. Okay? One of the things that the Pharisees believed and is based on certain scriptures in the Psalms, and you can find this in Josephus. If you read Josephus, he, he talks about this. Because Josephus was a Pharisee. All right? That the Pharisees believed a couple of hundred years before Jesus came to earth that the wicked would suffer eternal torment, eternal punishment. It's not something Christians made up. And the Pharisees who talked about this got that from the Psalms. Hello, somebody. So, oh, well, you know, the Psalm says Sheol. Okay, well, the Psalm says depth of Sheol. So let's take a look, right? Are you just going to keep digging your grave and keep digging and 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 digging? No, we're not talking about a deep grave here, folks. Anyway, we are to refuse those who deny that hell is real. We are to refuse those or refuse to hear those that deny that Christ is the only way to heaven. There are not many paths to God. This false teaching is that, well, since God is love, he accepts anyone who is sincere. Well, if this were true, that would make God the Son taking on flesh and dying on the cross for the sin of mankind, a pretty dumb idea, right? I mean, if you can just get to he he heaven with your own merits, and you know, just by being a, a sweet person, and you know, occasionally rescuing a puppy dog from being run over, and you know, well, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. I didn't kill anyone yesterday. <laughs> That'd be dying and suffering and dying on the cross for sin would be pretty dumb, then, wouldn't it? But that's not what happened. We are to deny any hearing to them who deny that Jesus Christ is not the only way to heaven. John 3, 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. 1 John 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. How about this one? John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We are to refuse to hear those that deny the deity of Christ. John 10, 30. I and my Father are one. And those that claim that this is not Jesus saying uh, that he is God fail to read on. John 10, 11, or, or 10 31-34. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not. But for blasphemy, because that thou being a man, makest thyself God. Oh, but God, but Jesus never claimed to be God. Nonsense. People that say that haven't read. John 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. He said here he is the eternal being that appeared to Moses. He used the self-identifier that God used when speaking to Moses. We are to refuse those. We are to refuse to hear them that deny that Jesus is God. Now, we are also to refuse to hear those that deny the virgin birth of Christ, his sinlessness, his literal death, and his literal resurrection. Those in the church that deny these things are wolves in sheep's clothing. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They're in sheep's clothing. Yes, take a look at me. I, I look pretty good, don't I? They, they know your vocabulary. They act like you. They've learned how to act Christian without being Christian. And they may 
give, they give you a good point every once in a while, but that just grooms you to accept the false doctrine that they will give you on another time. Oh, well, he's a Christian. He's Look at him. He, he's, he's good to his wife and his kids and, and his, his Doberman Pinscher doesn't bite anybody and and he's just, he's, look how good he looks in that suit. And look how professional. Oh, yeah, what a professional preacher. Listen, they look like Christians, but inwardly they're dead. They have not had their spirits resurrected. So they are still of that wicked one. They're still children of the devil. They've never become children of God. And even more so because they are, how do I put this? Even more so because they are there to misguide you. To keep Christians from growing and to keep non-Christians from becoming Christians. They have their own agenda and it doesn't line up with the Lord's. We are to refuse to hear those that teach that salvation has anything to do with good or religious works. Romans 11.6 And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. If it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So you get a paycheck for doing work, guys. You don't get a paycheck for grace. And if, if, if you do work and you get paid, that's different from somebody going here. You know, I'm going to give this to you even though you haven't done anything to earn it. That's very different. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, good works, good works are not a root. Okay, they don't lead to salvation. They are a fruit. Okay, you cannot earn your salvation. Okay, good works are not salvation earning. They are a fruit or a result of salvation. Read on to Ephesians 2.10. A lot of people don't. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We do not work to get saved. We do not work to maintain salvation. But because we've been spiritually resurrected on the inside. Okay. Ephesians 2, 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now this is what Jesus said, meant when he told Nicodemus, who was a Jewish leader. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of God, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Or Continuing on in John 3, 7, you must be born again. See, the ticket out of hell and into the presence of God is being born again. Not good works. It's the spiritual resurrection that takes place when one truly believes in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Moving on. We are to refuse to hear those that teach grace as though it's a license to sin. Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. How many times have I heard somebody get caught, gets caught in a sin, you try to correct them, and they go, oh, hey, brother, it's not works, I'm under grace. Really? I'm not going to say anything more about that. We'll be here all day. All right. Moving on to Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. See, the grace of God that brings salvation teaches you to be holy. Matthew 7, 21-23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now I've heard it said by some people, by some preachers, and I don't know if they were wolves in sheep's clothing or just tripped over their own brains. I have no idea on that because I haven't had a chance to listen to their other teachings. But after hearing what they said about this, I don't want to. They will say things like, oh, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, you see, God's will is that you just accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. See, you have to do the will of God. That's out of context. Because you, you see clearly 
that there are people who actually call him Lord. And they, they're, they're doing works in his name. They're doing good things in his name. They're, they're, in their minds, they're not doing it out of their carnal natures. They're, look, it's, look, we're prophesying. We're casting out devils. We're doing miracles. See, he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, you need to do, as I said before, the will of God which is from the heart. This is meant as a change. This is the, the faith changes you from the inside as the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside you and gives you a new nature. And out of that new nature, you want to do the will of God. Look at this. He says, I will profess unto you, I never knew you depart from me, you, work in, you that work iniquity. That means lawlessness. The commands of God don't apply to you. The word of God doesn't apply to you. That's what iniquity is, folks. It's lawlessness. Moving on. We are to refuse to hear those that teach doctrine that scratches your ears. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. We have also have an instance of this in Isaiah 30, verses 9 and 10. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord which say to the seers, see not unto the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. We don't want to hear truth. We want to hear stuff that makes us feel good. Don't, don't give us this stuff about holiness. Tell us how God blesses us every week. Tell us something positive every week. Why are you trying to tell us? We don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that holiness stuff. We don't want to hear that obedient stuff. Come on, preacher. You know, you know, if you don't tell us the stuff we want to hear, you know, we'll just go somewhere else and we'll take our tithe with us. Hello, somebody. These false teachers will say you were accepted by God, even if you're living lifestyles of flagrant rebellion against them. But you said a prayer. You're living like Satan, but you said a prayer. You don't care about sin. You're living in iniquity. Let me go back. You're living in iniquity, but you said a prayer. Right? Let me tell you something about sinner's prayer. I have no problem with the practice. No problem with it whatsoever. But you know what? Here's the thing about the prayer. It should come from a heart that has already been born again, that has already been resurrected. You have already come to faith. If you don't say the prayer from a point of faith, then it is just as much a dead work as anything else. Oh, but you're, you're living in flagrant rebellion, but you're still okay. That's what they tell you. They'll tell you that you're the children of God, even if you're still children of the devil. They will misdefine the word grace. They'll change it to mean something else. So that you can feel good and secure in your own sin, and you don't have to feel like you have to repent of your sinful lifestyle or something. Okay? And we're not talking about the struggle against sin. I'm not talking about a sin that besets you and that you're fighting against. You're fighting. Don't feel condemned. You're fighting. I'm talking about people that, that will tell you that you can live a lifestyle of unrepentant sin and still be okay with God. We are to refuse to hear those who only preach feel-good doctrine and never speak on sin, repentance, holiness, or other vital aspects of the faith. Or of, of, of sound doctrine of the faith. Acts 20, verses 26 and 27. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Well, why is he pure from the blood of all men? Let's continue. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Well, you know, I really don't want to tell them about repentance. Let's just go over here to this verse which says, God blesses them in all things. 
Let's go over here to this verse and talk. Oh, look, we have one that talks about favor, the favor of God. Oh, yeah, that'll, that'll be good. Oh, let's take this resurrection scripture that talks about the resurrection power of God and change it into saying, okay, well, God will resurrect your dreams. Man, that'll preach. No, it won't. That's not preaching. I have not shunned to you to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What happens if you do not declare all the counsel of God, preacher? Are you then pure from the blood of all men? And you that listen to them, think about it. Moving on. Moving, not muting. I don't even know what muting is. We contend through recognizing the nature of false teachers. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They come in sheep's clothing, so they try to look like you. They try to act like you. They know the lingo. They know some scriptures that they take out of context. But they're not converted. They have not received the spiritual resurrection, and so they're still dead in trespasses and sins, and are not guided by the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. These false teachers, Jesus calls them ravening wolves. Which, by the way, indicates that these people are evil. We contend through recognizing the ignorance of the false teacher. 1 Timothy 6, 3-4 If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, He is proud knowing nothing. Let's go through that again real quick. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, somebody. All right, let's, let's go back and, and, and look at the second one now. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing. We contend through recognizing error. 1 John 4, 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. But he, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We contend through not just recognizing error, but confronting error. Oh, brother, do you really have to talk about that preacher? Oh, brother, do you really have to say this about this guy? Oh, do you really have to say that about this other guy? Well, why are you tearing them down? Shouldn't you just be preaching the word of God and not tearing other preachers down? Really? Let's see what God has to say. Titus 1.13, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Hello, somebody. Rebuke them sharply. How about this? 1 Timothy 5.20 Them that sin rebuke before all that others may also fear. Rebuke before all. 2 Timothy 4.2 Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Repuve, reprove. Rebuke. I took reprove and rebuke and tried to combine them in my head. I tripped over my brain. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Someone once said, Well, you know, I pastor a non doctrinal church. Uh, what? What again? What was that? It's a, a non doctrinal church? Yeah, we don't really talk about doctrine. I'm like, What do you preach every Sunday? If you don't preach doctrine, I was like, you know doctrine is teaching, right? Someone need to shut down your seminary there, preacher. You don't, you're a non-doctrinal church? And I even asked him two or three times to make sure that he didn't misspeak. I gave him grace. I gave the man grace. I have, are you sure you meant non-doctrinal? Yes, we're a non-doctrinal church. Okay, I'm just, it's crazy. All right, anyway. I don't want to go to a non-doctrinal church, sorry. Jay, I want to learn. I want to learn the things of God. I want you to know the things of God. James 5, 19-20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, 
Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Listen, some who live and walk in error can be converted to truth. Hello, somebody. Right here. Right here. Okay? I'm that guy. Now, there may be people that are like, now, wait a minute, brother. You know, what about if you can't, you know, if somebody's on TV. Well, you know, I don't know if they're reading my emails. I don't know if it, but I can warn the people that the sheep are coming. Or that I can warn the sheep. Let me try that again. Okay. I can warn the people, the sheep, that the wolves are coming. I can warn them of the false doctrine that's being spouted by these people. Anyway, moving on. 2 Timothy 2, 24-25, And the servant of God must not strive. Okay? Well, it means we don't fight with each other. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Listen. We, we don't go in there with our sledgehammers, right? And start beating the snot out of these people. Re but you just said rebuke them before all. Yes, you rebuke them before all. You know, you can rebuke somebody kindly. I've done it. I've had it done to me. You can rebuke somebody in kindness. Okay? You can tell them. And you can be very, very serious. You can even be forceful. But you can be in such a way that you are not trying to cause them to be offended, but to see the truth of what you're saying. It's very important. Contend, but don't be contentious, in other words. We don't fight and get mean with those in error. We contend against their error as we instruct them. Now, if they get offended anyway and they want to walk away, well, that's fine. Cast not your pearls before swine. Okay, and there, and, and let me let me tell you a little something about swine. Here's the problem. Okay, they see your pearls as stones. Think about that for a second. They see that pearl and they think it's a weapon. Okay, they think that pearl that you just tossed at them is a weapon meant to hit them and hurt them. So they will take your pearls, see them as stones, and attack you. Moving on. We contend through support of those who are faithful. Strengthen the things that remain, Revelation 3, 2, that are ready to die. Ready to die. They're ready to enter eternity. If they remain, they need to be strengthened. We, any of us, could die at any time. We contend through withholding support on the other end of the coin from those who do not preach all the counsel of God. They don't tell the whole story. They only preach parts they like or the parts they know you will like. Continuing uh, continuation here of Revelation 3, 2 is, For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Oh, ouch. We're not talking about perfection in human terms, but in terms of being mature and careful with the Word of God. Listen, we can all die at any moment. I could, right here, fall on the floor, heart stops beating. It can happen. Okay? So... I'm going to tell you something. Shame on the people, these ministers, these fakes, who handle the Word of God flippantly and loosely. Repent. Get on your hands and knees. Seek the grace of God for, 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 for all of the things that you've done to mislead people. People could die at any minute, and you're over there joking around with them. Now, is a joke from the pulpit okay every once in a while? I don't see a problem with it, but if you are not, the, the problem is when people want to turn the whole thing into a comedy show and not really give you any truth. They'll sit with you for 40 minutes. You'll sit in that pew or that chair, and you won't learn anything about the Word of God. You'll just sit there and laugh and leave and go, man, that was a good... Might as well say show. It wasn't a service. Lots of ministries, folks, should be shut down and shut down fast and hard. We need discernment. Listen, if you support a false doctrine or a false church, you're going to share in their bad fruit. You need to repent and ask forgiveness. If you support a, tr a church that has departed from the Bible and fundamental doctrine, you will reap the reward of that false teaching with them. 
Stop sending money to places like Trickery Broadcasting Network. Okay? We are not to support men like those found in Isaiah 56, 11, or 56, 10 through 12. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving a slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are, they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Everyone for his game, from his quarter. We are not to support those folks who do not bark as a warning of danger. My dog is the sweetest little, quietest little thing. I can't get, I'm trying to train her to talk and I can't. You know, it's like, talk! I can't do it. She won't listen. I can't get her to do that. But I'm telling you what, someone knocks on the door or even passes by, she's at that door barking. She's letting us know, hey, there's somebody there. Okay? Because the dog sees that as possible danger. We're not to support lazy dogs that don't bark. That don't warn us. We're not to support lazy dogs that do not study diligently. We're not support to support greedy dogs in the ministry who have the primary intention of making money. And this is not a statement against full-time ministers, but those who are misusing the gospel to become rich. Listen, the set rep, situation report in a nutshell. People claiming to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ were and are bringing in damnable heresies into the church, living carnally and convincing others that carnal living is acceptable while the person is still, and saying rather, that the person is still acceptable to God. It's okay, you can live like that. You can, you can live in unrepentant sin and still go to heaven. That's what they tell you. Meanwhile, my Bible says that Jesus came to, to, to purify people for himself that were zealous of good works, Titus. It's Titus chapter 2. Okay? The salvation of many is, was back then, and is today on the line as evil teachings are spreading, and even spreading so much more today. With television and the internet, we need to fight false teaching. Okay? But always with the goal that people are saved, that they come to Jesus Christ, speaking the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 Sometimes love does not look loving. Jesus was love walking. And look at some of the things that He said. And yet, He is love. Look at some of the things God is love. Look at some of the things He said too in the, in the Father said in the Old Testament. And that may have even been the pre incarnate Christ as well. God is love. He had some very, very, very pointed things to say. See, what we define as love... We think of it as lovey doveyness and it's not always lovey dovey. Okay? Contending is offering a defense, which is an apologetic of sound doctrine, and an offense, which is called a polemic against false doctrines. We defend the truth without getting defensive, and we try to offend without being offensive. The truth itself is offensive enough without our help. Listen, the primary goal of a minister should not be to entertain you or to make you feel good, but to give you the truth to get you saved. That is not to say that there aren't some things in the Bible where you're preaching and you're preaching through the Bible and you come across something that is, you know, that is uplifting. It happens all the time. There's stuff in there that's very uplifting. And if we preach all the counsel of God, we're going to preach that too. If you are saved, if you're not saved, our goal should be to get you saved. And if you are saved, our goal should be to equip you with biblical knowledge. If anyone is listening today and you are not saved in Christ, you can repent of your sin. By repent, it just means you understand that your sin, which is the times you have disobeyed and offended a holy God, okay, that's, that's your sin. You can repent of that, which means you understand that your sin has offended a holy God and you don't want to do it anymore. You turn from it. And you confess Jesus now. You can confess Him now and ask the Lord to come into your life and save you by His blood sacrifice on that cross and give you that victory over death that He had in His resurrection. 
Lord, you can say this. Something, something to this extent. No, I'm not trying to give you a formula. I'm not trying to give you exact words to say. Let it come from your spirit. But it can be something like this. Lord, I believe in you. I know that my sin put Jesus Christ on that cross and he died for the sins of humanity. He took my punishment so I wouldn't have to. Please save me and help me live a life acceptable to the Lord. I confess that Jesus is both, both Savior and Lord. Thank you for what you have done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this message, Lord. Thank you for everybody that's listening. I pray upon them a blessing, Lord. I thank you for all the things that you have done for us all, Father God, to, from, from sending Jesus to die on that cross, Father God. And every part of him was in agony, Lord. From his head to his foot, there was no soundness in him at all. God, his, everything that he did, his, his people don't understand the... He was whipped before he went to the cross. He was put on that cross with, with, with that wood that still splinters that, and nails driven in, in his hands and feet. And God just, he suffered so much for me and for everybody, God. God, the nerve pain. We don't even talk about the nerve pain that he suffered. Everything. From, from having thorns shoved into his head and then beaten into his head by soldiers. And even the and even with all the physical pain, the the inner pain of knowing A that he was rejected and B Lord, that in His humanity, God, that You, that the Father would turn from Him. That Jesus never stopped being God. But in His humanity, You turned from Him. Because that's the point in time He took the sin of the world upon Himself. Lord, I thank You, Father God, for all that You've done for all of us, Father God. I thank you, God, and I pray, Father God, for salvation, Father God. I pray, God, that, that you use me to bring souls into the kingdom. In Jesus' holy name, amen.